Hey everybody, welcome back once again to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley with you once again. So let's see, let's go ahead and jump into 1357, Starless Night. So, uh, again, another uh, another Drizzt novel, and uh, boy, they just keep coming, don't they? So another Drizzt novel, here's the plot in a nutshell. Drizzt goes back to Menzo Baranzen, which, having read that about 800 times now, the joke of saying it so it goes on forever because there's like 37 z's in it come on it's ridiculous it's getting old so i'll try to pronounce it like it's supposed to be pronounced now or at least as a close approximation thereof Drus goes back to menzo baronzen and is captured and rescued that's it that's really the entire novel um the best part is, uh, there's no real motivation for him to go back. Uh, ostensibly, it's because he's going back to see, well, what if there's another me trapped down there? Or what if there's another Zach Nathan who I could uh, save from that dark path that Zach Nathan trod because he thought it was the only way? You know, like, I know that there's sunlight and we can live in it and it's awesome down here and woohoo! But then, like, almost immediately he's captured. And when his friends come after him, to save him. I'm not going to say that he uh, has to be saved by them because it's drizzed. I mean, he would have found an opening and gotten out of it. It would have been fine. But as soon as they come down there, he's like, all right, cool, let's go. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Uh, oh, also, um, Entreri's back because when he fell off that cliff before, we retcon it in so that there's a, there's a net that caught him. Um, there was like a spider web net. And he's hanging out with Jarl Axel. That's uh, th the two good things about this book, if you want to call them good, were um, the fact that Jarlaxle is still awesome. Um, I still really enjoy Jarlaxle. My favorite thing is that he randomly chooses which eye to wear his eye patch on, um, which <laughs> I just think is great. I don't know if it's in this book or a different one uh, where we find out that the eye patch is apparently some sort of like psionic dampening device. It's like Magneto's helmet, which. <laughs> Just alone, just... Okay, first of all, the ridiculousness of Magneto's helmet being a psionic dampening device, okay? Like, he could have gone for anything, even something as cool as an eye patch, and instead he went for that goofy-ass helmet. Then, yeah, just run with that. So, uh, so yeah, and Trary's back, and he's working with the drow and hanging out there, and Jarlaxle's hanging out and being awesome, and uh, the rest of the drow are just... Oh, so annoying. You want to just crush them beneath your fingers. Oh, the other good thing about this is the Wolfgar stays dead, uh, shockingly enough, for an entire book. I mean, it's not like I hate Wolfgar, but uh, everybody comes back to life like crazy in this series, and that gets really annoying pretty fast. This is also uh, I, I, two things about this book. I think it's the first time in this series where Salvatore doesn't constantly call Drizzt a black elf. Now, anywhere else in the realms, anywhere else where there's drow, they always call them dark elves because from all the paintings and pictures and stuff, they seem to have kind of a purplish hue to their skin, like a like a really deep violet black, I guess, if you will. But for uh, whatever reason, uh, I think it's pretty obvious what the reason is, Salvatore constantly drives home, no, 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 he's a black elf, and everybody judges him because of his skin color. Black. And it was kind of like pondering on this, this and, and a couple of other things, that I realized the other thing about this book is it's the first time where I recognized what Salvatore is writing here, really. And that is, he's not writing realms novels, he's not writing really fantasy novels per se. What he's writing are essentially scripts for a Saturday morning cartoon show. Um, think, think about it. I, imagine, like... Drizzt and Gwen fighting and Regis kind of trundling along and all these sort of, uh, oh, and uh, everything that Harkel Harper does. Just the, the sensibility and the sense of humor and the sense of honor and, like, don't be a racist, kids. It's so a G.I. Joe cartoon, except, you know, not G.I. Joe, but you know what I'm saying. It's, it's a Saturday morning cartoon. Like, uh, it's a, I would say, better version <laughs> than what we got with that weird Dungeons & Dragons um, cartoon from the 80s where obviously whoever made that hated their GM in their game if any of them actually played a game. But yeah, it's uh, that's what it is. It's, it's totally a Saturday morning cartoon. And once you realize that, the books become, I think, a lot more fun and a lot more enjoyable. 
So don't let anybody tell you, like, this is great fantasy or whatever. It's not. It's not even really very good popcorn fantasy because, again, it's just overwritten. Like, I, the editor in me really wants to go in and edit it down. I think every trilogy could essentially be one book, and um, this four-parter here could still be one book because nothing happens in the first two books except the drow attack, they fight them back, <laughs> and Trist is like, man, you know those drow... I want to go live with them, or whatever. I don't know. It didn't make any sense. Well, it made sense, but then they, they just co totally counteract with the fact that he just runs out at the first opportunity. We also get more look into the uh, machinations of the drow houses here, because we're back in Menzo Baranzen. But, of course, that's really annoying and hackneyed and, oh, I mean, it just grates so fast. But again, they make great Saturday morning cartoon villains. I'm trying to think, I, I think that's all I had to say about that book, so we'll leave that... Uh, for now, the problem is that I haven't recorded in a while, but I've been reading, so I'm like over halfway through Siege of Darkness now, and I've got all sorts of stuff to say about that. But, not there yet, so let's jump ahead to uh, 1358, Wyvern Spur, uh, second book of the Finderstone trilogy. And I'm not sure if it happens before, during, or after the Time of Troubles. It's just kind of thrown in there. Um, definitely in the third one, Song of the Sorials, they mention that Time of Troubles happened, which I love. <laughs> I kind of love how that's shrugged off. It's like, oh, last summer when the gods walked the earth and stuff, whatever. So, uh, Wimmer and Spurb, who knows? Uh, it could happen it, it could happen during, for all... No, I guess it can't, because there's magic going on. But in any case, Wimmer and Spur possibly answers why the Finderstone trilogy wasn't as successful as Salvatore's stuff. Not because it's bad, because it's not. It's really, really good. But... Because everybody who enjoyed Azure Bonds, I could see really being frustrated with Wyvern Spur. In Azure Bonds, there's this minor character whose entire purpose, well, for the first half of the book, is a, a plot point in which he impersonates King Azun and that causes Alias to try to kill him because she's kind of a Manchurian candidate. She has like 8,000 pre-programmed horrible things in her in that book, and I guess they're all gone now. I don't know, I lost track of them there in the uh, the climax, but anyway... Point being, that's mostly this character's purpose. And then he also uh, pops back up because the king sends him as a courier and he's uh, the first person to interact with uh, another of Alias's doubles. But but he's just this minor comic relief character. Wyvern Spur is, in fact, all about him, the nameless bard, and Olive, the halfling, uh, who wants to be a bard. So this novel is just like, yeah, you know that cool adventuring party we had last time? They're gone. Now you have to put up with a kind of bumbling nobleman. And, uh, like, the first third of the book, Olive is, uh... <laughs> Olive tries to steal his purse. Well, she succeeds in stealing his purse. And it turns her into an ass because his purse is enchanted. So she gets turned into an ass. And, um, she goes to try to let him know, like, Hey, just turn me into a donkey. Please turn me back. And, uh, he just thinks she's a pretty donkey, so or a pretty burrow. So he takes her with him. And, like... The first third of the book is like Olive as a burrow going into these catacombs to find the Swivern Spur with him because it's a family heirloom and da 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 da. Because of the clever, uh, I, I thought clever, foreshadowing with Olive being transformed and because of some of the stuff that we learned through the book, I pretty quickly was like, oh, the Wyvern Spur turns you into a Wyvern. That ought to be interesting. And that is, in fact, what happens. That's what it does. And that's what the climax ends up being is. Joji, Jojo, however you pronounce it, Wyvern Spur are a kind of effete, seemingly worthless main character going up against a powerful wizard as a Wyvern. It is one of the craziest experiments with uh, uh, character arcs that I've ever seen done in a kind of genre fantasy novel. And what a huge shock that must have been to people who loved the first one, because, you know, the first one is all about Alias and Dragonbait and um, Akabar and, like, the rise of Moander, this evil dark god who doesn't have sway over the world or whatever. And, and then they're just nowhere in the second book. You know, it's obviously a continuation of the same story and what have you, but it's, uh, it, it's totally nothing like the first book, except for the fact that it has the same sense of humor, and it's uh, still really well written. Though, I'll admit, in this one, I did find, like, every other chapter or so, it felt like it really dragged down at first, but then it finally started uh, picking up again. And I, 
I don't know. I mean, I think I know why they're doing it, but it does get kind of tiring that, like, every single character in this book, except for Olive, turns out to be either a Wyvern Spur or an Alias clone, who's technically a Nameless Bard clone, but whatever. Oh, and we also find out the Nameless Bard's name. It's Finder, which makes sense why it's called Finder Stone Trilogy, because he did, in fact, invent the stone that they still call a Finder Stone, but they think it's just called that because it finds people. But no, 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 it's called that because it was named after Finder. So this is a great book. Highly, highly enjoyed it. Uh, I greatly recommend this trilogy. I'm uh, a little over halfway through the third one, and I'm digging it as well, but I'll wait to say anything more on that. Again, we're clocking in at uh, over 10 minutes here, it looks like, so I'll wrap this up. I really do want to mention Whisper of Waves. Get into that because I think I have a lot to say on it. I really like the book, and I, I think I have some interesting things to say on it. So hopefully next time we'll talk about uh, Siege of Darkness, Song of the Sorials, and uh, Whisper of Waves, and then the time after that should be really fun because we're going to look at the Time of Troubles, which is, of course, the Avatar trilogy, Shadows of the Avatar trilogy, and, uh, you know, it crosses over into Siege of Darkness. Da -da 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 -da. Uh, it sets up everything. It'll be uh, fun to talk about, and... I'm looking forward to it. I have actually read those books fairly recently, so I'm not going to reread them, but i um, going to talk more about the Time of Troubles in general, I think. Talk to you next time. Thanks very much. This is Realms Remembered. Michael T. Bradley. Have a good day. Please feel free to comment and rate.